Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that is not only tall and charming, but he can grow a full beard in the course of an afternoon. He is the captain. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you through all this beard hair. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Tonight we are drinking Warped Speed Scotch Ale by the marvelous people over at Lake Louis Brewing in beautiful Arena, Wisconsin. Garage grade three and three quarter bottle caps out of five. Warped Speed Scotch Ale is brewed in that traditional style of the 1700s. It's a beautiful reddish brown color. This is full bodied with a smooth light hopped finish. And Warp Speed was brought to us by these beautiful people. First up, a big shout out and thank you to Nicole and her husband, Bill, over in Marietta, Georgia. And from beautiful parts unknown, we have Word Girl Sammy and Monty. We like your jib. Next, we have Mary Pierre up in Montreal, Canada. Next up, we have Michelle from Hunters Hill, New South Wales. And last but not least, we have Janine in Kalama, Washington. So thanks to everybody for buying us around for this week's show. If you want to buy us around for next week's show, go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the donate button. Yeah, and I want to say a big thank you to everybody that has been purchasing the t-shirts. And then they like to take a picture of themselves in the t-shirt and then send it to us on social media. So that's been a lot of fun. And you all look so beautiful. We have the most beautiful listeners. The garage is surrounded in beauty those dudes are hot all right captain settle down everybody gather around grab a beer grab a chair let's talk some true crime Painful first, tomorrow marks one year since Missy Beavers was murdered in a Midlothian church. Police have video of her killer, but have sorted through 1,400 tips. But as News 8's Tanya Iser reports, it's not enough to solve this case. A seven-second video captured the mysterious killer with a distinctive walk, roaming around Midlothian's Creekside Church of Christ for a half hour, dressed all in black in police tactical gear and a bulletproof vest. Missy Beavers, there to teach an early morning Camp Gladiator class, was killed with puncture wounds to the head and chest. The morning of April 18, 2016, if you would have told me that we would be in this parking lot talking about this case a year later, I would have thought you were out of your mind. Her killing shocked the tiny town and made national headlines. Nothing was taken, not even Beavers' iPad and planner. What the killer used to kill her, investigators won't say, or even if they've recovered that weapon. It's a vital um, piece of information in this case that we want to protect until we uh, have an opportunity to confront the killer with it. <laughs> Her husband, Brandon Beavers, was not talking today. <laughs> this was him sobbing at a vigil the day after her death. Because you have sad moments, you have angry moments, you have moments of where you're up here because you remember all the amazing things that she did and she said. And Renee Jones is the head trainer for Camp Gladiator and a friend of Beavers. The hardest part for us is just just the acknowledgement and uh, not knowing, you know, like everybody else. She has faith that the killer will be caught. Tonight's workout she's teaching will be in her friend's honor. There's a lot of, there's a lot of um, split opinions on this case, whether she was targeted or not, whether it was random. Some people see a woman in that video, some people see a man. And so who killed Missy Beavers remains a mystery a year later. Midlothian, Texas is located about 25 miles southwest of Dallas, Texas. Now, back in 2010, the population was listed at about 18,000 people. So today, let's say the population is probably somewhere around the 20,000 mark. Now, our story starts off on Monday, April 18th, 2016. Terry Missy Beavers is 45 years old. We'll go by, she goes by Missy most of the time. So we will refer to her as Missy Beavers. Uh, she's a fitness instructor. She's married. She's the mother of three daughters. She was found murdered on that Monday inside the Creekside Church in, Mid in Midlothian, Texas. 
where she was scheduled to teach a class earlier that morning. Later that day, the Midlothian Police Department released surveillance video from the church that showed Missy's killer. Now, this person is dressed in police tactical gear, walking through the halls of the church, opening doors and breaking glass prior to Missy's arrival. Initial reports suggested that Missy may have been may have interrupted a burglary in progress at the church and that she had been killed as a result. Mm-hmm. But as time went on, police revealed that they were working on the theory that Missy had been targeted. Now, I thought, Captain, that this was somewhat of a popular case. However, when we started working on this, I quickly realized it's not as well known as I had expected. But if you've never heard of this case, well, hold on to your seats because this thing is very interesting. This is an interesting case, especially with that surveillance footage. And we'll get to that shortly. Well, and this surveillance footage is going to give the police some kind of timeline of these events. But again, this is going to be very similar to like the Delphi murders where there is some video evidence that they released to the public. But I'm assuming that this is a very small fragment of a, of the amount of information that the police have. Okay, so here's a timeline of what we know that occurred on April 18th. At an unknown time, a person, this could be a man or a woman, disguised in what can only best be described as police tactical gear. This looks like something that you would expect to see a police officer wearing for a riot situation Mm -hmm. or like a possible SWAT uniform. Um, But this person arrives at the church and forces their way inside. Now, at 3.50 a.m., the suspect is first seen on surveillance video. At 4.16 a.m., Missy is seen on surveillance video arriving in the parking lot and entering the church building. I want to discuss this portion before we get to the video here. Mm -hmm. uh, Because this is the way that the police, they announce this timeline. And this sentence here has caused a lot of speculation because they said Missy is seen on surveillance video arriving in the parking lot and entering the church building. We have not seen any video footage from outside of the church building itself. Okay. Uh, so there's, there's speculation as to was there any cameras outside of this building, you know, facing the parking lot. I think what, what has happened here is that there's not any surveillance video from outside of the building. Right. I think that they just made this statement um, because she is, she is killed when she enters the church building itself. I think that the statement is just unclear the way that they said this. I don't think there is actually any video from outside of the building itself. Now at 5 a.m., this was the scheduled time for her class that she was teaching. This is when the first 911 calls come in from Missy's students who had arrived at the church reporting that Missy is unresponsive. So officers and EMS arrived on the scene and they discovered what they said is a lot of broken glass on the floor inside the building. The day prior to the murder, Missy had posted on her Facebook page that she was going to be hosting the class the next morning at 5 a.m., rain or shine. Mm -hmm. And it was raining that morning. Well, yeah, because I believe this class was something that they would do outside. Yes. So since there was going to be rain, they had to move the location to the church. Yeah, and I think her statement was something like, you know, even though it's raining, we will still be training. And so, like the captain said, they moved the class inside. So she's killed when she arrives at the church um, very quickly after her arrival. And then the students find her, or well, the people in her class find her at 5 a.m. Now, what I think we should do, Captain, is I think we should watch the video, describe what we're seeing, because there are people that are listening that have not seen the video. Um, <laughs> <laughs> They're still not going to see it on the podcast. <laughs> so we'll describe what we see and discuss some of the topics uh, that and questions that this video presents. And this footage is very short, but I'll I'll copy this footage and put it on our website at truecrimegarage.com. Yes, and this is a short video, like the captain said. And when we first, the first image that we see is we see somebody walking into the building. Um, They're coming through a door. Um, We don't see how the person gained access to the building itself. Um, But the first thing that's the haunting image that you notice is this appears to be a police officer wearing SWAT gear. And we're talking about there's a vest Um, there's dark pants, dark boots, 
uh, or dark tennis shoes. There's some debate about that, uh, but they have the helmet on as well. And the on the vest, it says police on the back. Um, and it looks to me at one point in the video like I can see the plates. You know how they put like plates inside these vests mm-hmm. um, to make them bulletproof? I think I see a plate there. Um, but this suspect walks through a door and then goes to the next door and tries well, to force it open. No, no. no. The, the scene starts with the, the suspect at a door, mm-hmm. opening a door, but it's not going through that door. Okay. So how did the suspect get to this door? We don't know. Right. It just starts with it. You know, the suspect's hand is on a door or this tool that they have to open up the doors. Um, and what I'm assuming is they have a tool that they're just pushing the door lock Mm -hmm. and then that's opening up the door for them. So not a lot of effort to open up that door. Yeah. So you're right. So they do not enter. They don't walk through that door. They just open it up and they don't even really go into whatever room that appears to be. No, they just, it looks like they just look inside. Yeah. So again, like we said, there's a helmet, there's black shirt, there's the black vest, there's a black pants, boots, gloves but the interesting thing about the helmet is it seems pretty shiny it doesn't seem like a flat uh black or a matte black finish Mm -hmm. which you would think would be more um you know official police uniform because you don't have a swat team helmet where it's shiny because then if they're trying to take cover um you know whoever they're taking cover from could see where they're at based on the shine of their helmet This part right here is very interesting to me, Captain, because the person, the suspect is trying to force open this door. Mm -hmm. And what do you see in the hands there? I see what looks to be like a hammer, a pretty heavy duty hammer, Mm -hmm. um, along with a, like a pry bar. Um, and it looks to me like the person, like you said, jams the pry bar in between the, the door and the frame. Right. And can't get this door open. So they use the hammer to bang on the end of the pry bar. Like they're going to force it open, but we will see the suspect very quickly give up on trying to get into this door. Yeah. So the first door is interesting that they want to open and they don't really go into, it has a little window. Mm -hmm. And then this next door that they're trying to open doesn't have a window. So again, this is a church. Some would speculate that it's a Monday. So maybe that this person is breaking in, into the church so they could steal the the offerings of of that Sunday. Yeah, they're the person after after giving up on trying to get into the door, they adjust their gloves or make sure that their gloves are secure on them. Yeah, and probably more important than that, you know, we kind of talked about is there a hammer? Is there also like some pry bar? Mm-hmm. Uh, this kind of clearly shows that the suspect is putting something away onto the right side of their body and then also holding onto something in their left side of the body. So indicating that there would be two objects. Right. And one of the big things in this case is do police officers do, do law enforcement, do they have the weapon, the murder mm-hmm. weapon? Well, in this case, this shows that there's possibility of having two different murder weapons. Yeah. And at this point, the person appears to put the pry bar away, like maybe in a belt Mm -hmm. or in their pocket and then turns and kind of faces the camera and you see the this weird with their feet kind of apart their toes pointing outward yeah but but legs together and then they start walking near the camera and at this point you can see the the hammer is still in this person's hand yeah and i think this is the most you know most interesting part of the video footage when they talk about this gate Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the way in which a person walks. Now there was actually some speculation on this case that the person that was walking uh, in this surveillance footage was walking with a fake walk. Mm -hmm. To me, there doesn't look anything fake about it. It doesn't seem like the person's, um, you know, it seems like the person's really focused on getting in the door. And when it's, they can't get in the door, they take off walking. They're not thinking too much about uh, their mannerisms. Right. And the best way, the way that I've I've thought that this was best described, um, is that I've heard one person say that, uh, that a very unorthodox and unnatural posture and stance, especially when walking. And it's, it's what's been described as a wide gate. And at 50 seconds into this video, 
and again, posting the video that we're talking about on the website, truecrimegarage.com. When you look at this footage on about 50 seconds in, this is a, another thing that people speculate a lot too, is how big is this individual? Mm-hmm. You know, you know, it, how round are they? Mm-hmm. So here's a couple things that I find interesting at, at 50 and 51, it looks like this individual might have somewhat of a belly, mm-hmm. right? But once you get to, uh, let me get there. Yeah, I'm with you. It, it looks like the person has a belly. And then, you know, there's been debate. Are those the plates that are in the vest? Or mm-hmm. does this person have some boobage or some or or some kind of belly? Uh, because, again, we don't know if this is a man or a woman. Or is it boobage and a belly? Right. right. But here at 50, about the 54 mark, um, the person is very close to the camera at this point, And mm-hmm. they kind of turn to their side. And I don't think the person looks to have much of a belly there. No, it looks more like you're seeing the vest. Yeah. And that's, again, and you get a closer look at this helmet. Again, it's this shiny helmet. Again, how authentic is this helmet? I would say not very authentic. Now, this next part on the on the video is one that I've watched this small clip time and time again. It, the person walks up to a door. And mm-hmm. opens up the door, gra- you know, grabs the doorknob, opens up the door, mm-hmm. and there. Th- then the top of the door does not open. It's one of those split doors. And to me, I've watched this part over and over again. Well, let's go back a little bit. Let's let's start at the fifty-five second mark. Okay. And this is when the individual is going to walk across the screen again. It almost looks like the individual is walking with a limp. Uh, looks like it's almost dragging the right foot a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, some people have speculated that maybe this person has either a fake leg or, um, in my world, uh, maybe a peg leg. Or an injury of mm-hmm. some sort. Um, one thing I do want to mention here, Captain, though, is look what the person just walked past mm-hmm. on their way to that door. We've seen... Early in the video, we see this person try, opens up one door, goes to the immediate next door, and then tries to pry that door open. In this scene, they walk right by two different doors. Mm -hmm. One that that is open and one that is closed without attempting to go into the open door or even try the closed door. Well, and the other speculation here, too, is you almost see a little bit about 59 seconds in you see almost like some light hitting the the bottom end mm-hmm. that maybe this uh, person has a little bit of a, a badonka dunk. I think yeah. is the scientific term. Yeah, we're using a lot of big scientific words. Today. Uh, boobage and um, badonka dunk. Our teachers oh. and professors would be very impressed. Um, so then now the person walks up to this door. It looks like double doors. And then opens. Well, but let's get back to the badonka dunk. Do you see that? A little bubble butt at the- I, I see it but you what you you know what i actually think i'm seeing there mm-hmm. i think that that's either the vest extends down and hangs and kind of dangles there no or let me throw this at you i think this person may have some kind of what i'm going to refer to as a like a batman utility belt that mm-hmm. that this person may have a lot of different tools and equipment with them we've already seen a pry bar and a hammer yeah. So well, I don't know that I see a badonka donk. I think yeah, I, I feel I, like I see something hanging off of this person. I think it's also possible that this individual is wearing multiple layers of clothes. So mm-hmm. this could be like, you know, pants on top of pants. So stop it right there. So we have the 110 mark is the door that this person opens up. And then this is the scene that I've watched over and over again. Yeah, Watch w- this. Yeah, 103. Yeah, 103. Sorry. Yeah, so, he, he, he Nick's a little further away from the screen than I am. So. <laughs> And he might be a little more drunk than some of them. So, yeah, the individual goes. And clearly, at 103, if you pause it, you can see a, a hammer. Ha- a hammer. That's absolutely a hammer. And right? that's in the left hand. And it doesn't look like it doesn't look like a regular hammer. It looks to me like a heavy-duty claw hammer. But just watch from one, 102 to 103. When you hit play, it's almost like they lost balance a little bit. Then yeah. they open the bottom door. They open the top door. Now this, 
as this individual is opening up this, uh, what do they call that kind of door? Well, I'm I'm just going to call it a split door. So okay. the bottom the bottom portion opens. Since we're going with uh, all these technical terms, and then the today. top the top part opens as well, but they don't open together. And mm-hmm. this is the part I've watched over and over again. The suspect opens up the bottom portion of the door, and then if you if you play that again, the suspect then like looks upward, like almost in surprise that the whole door didn't open up. Right. And that's one thing I kept going back and forth on here. Has this person been in the building before or not? And it, it looks to me like this person's not been in the building before or, or didn't know that this door would, would not open normally. Right now, but this individual has been in this church for how long now? Um, well, they would have been in the church for about about a half an hour before she's killed. Mm-hmm. Now, um, now, why was this individual able to walk through this church building without the cops showing up? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think there's any alarm on the building. No, there's not. Right. So that that would go with the question. A lot of people started to assume, well, this person knew that this church didn't have alarm. Right. And then they knew that they could get into the building and they could take their time. Mm-hmm. So now the person's opened up that split door and g- stepped inside, but very quickly turns around and exits that room, whatever that room is. Yeah, and that's another thing that's kind of difficult with this whole situation is you don't know the building yourself, so you mm-hmm. have no clue if they're opening up a closet or if they're opening up like an actual classroom or, or what they're opening. Because, you know, again, the speculation at first is that she, you know, Missy uh, Beavers walks into a situation where somebody is breaking and and stealing stuff or, or planning to steal stuff um, in a church. Yeah. And, and it, she just kind of walks in on that. And that's why this crime took place. And so when you see this footage, you go, well, well, this individual is not stealing anything. In this next portion, we will see the individual walking down the hallway, and then they appear to turn to their right and possibly go down another hallway or, or, or step into a hallway. Mm-hmm. Well, no, it looks like they sit at a door for a while. Oh, yeah, yeah, next I see door. that. And uh, so let's, let me go back just a second. Bear Maybe. with us, people. All right. So yeah, about one seventeen, one eighteen, they're messing with some other door. Yeah, you're right. There is a door there. You can see Yeah, but what's weird with this video footage, at least the one that I'm going to post on the thing or post on the website, is it almost seems like the video freezes for a second. Yeah. No leg movement. All of a sudden, boom, and then all of a sudden he's in a, he or she's in a different portion of the hallway and now walking back almost retracing their steps. Yeah, towards and again you can see something in the right hand. I don't know if you can see anything in the left hand. I don't see anything in the left hand. It looks to me like that's still the hammer in the right hand. Yeah, again, so, you know, the speculation whether this is a a break-in. And look, here, here's what we do know. It's a break-in. Right. And there are people that just have broken to buildings before, and they don't steal anything. Yeah, so then you see the person walking and kind of tapping or patting on the wall very casually as they're walking down the hallway. Um, and at one point you, we will see this individual coming through a door. Mm -hmm. Uh, seems like a different hallway. Yeah. And I can't tell if that's light shining from the other room or reflecting off of this helmet, but there's kind of a flash of light and then there's something in the person's hand. So we see the hammer, what appears like they're swinging the hammer and busting open a door or yeah. maybe some glass. Well, and they're doing so with the right hand. With their so right we- hand. There's something in the left hand, and this is not the pry bar that I saw earlier. No. This is like, oh, it, I can only describe it as like a white box. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so did this person take this box with them? Or, or was this something that they picked up inside the, the, yeah. Was this something they picked up inside the building and stole, stole, or was this something that was brought into the church with them? Um, and this is where, after after the suspect smashes, we can't see if that's a window or a door. It almost looks like it has a flashlight on its belt. See that right there? Yeah, there's something flashlight dangling head. from from a belt or from a pocket. Mm-hmm. It could be keys or a small flashlight. Right. I can't really tell what it is. And then you see the person walking nonchalantly down the hallway and patting on the wall or touching the wall as they walk what what I see, Captain, is somebody that doesn't seem to be in any kind of hurry at all. Nope. This person's not in a hurry. This uh, this person also, 
I don't think they think the police are ever going to show up or this person by this point knows that there's a, no alarm on the building. They're not afraid of somebody showing up that I can't explain to you how casual this person looks. Right. But that would make me believe that this suspect knew this building didn't have alarm system. Right. Uh, and also that this building had surveillance. And here's another thing that's interesting. Like we said, the, the main uh, speculation is that there is no surveillance of the parking lot. Mm -hmm. So this individual might've known that as well. We're talking about a very small town. I mean, I come from a, a pretty small town right out outside of Columbus and looking at maybe like, I don't know, 45,000, 50,000. Mm -hmm. And this, this town is under 20,000. Right. So this is a pretty small community. Everybody kind of probably knows everybody. Yeah. Um, can, my, here's my thought, uh, on the person busting in these doors and attempting to open these doors. I think that the person is looking for the, for where, whatever room that the camera, uh, system is, is operating from the AV equipment. Yeah. Looking to destroy that computer or whatever is housing that information. All right. So you're talking about the actual surveillance yes. of the church. Yes. I don't mean that he, he or she was looking to steal AV equipment that, you know, expensive, uh, AV equipment. I think they're looking to destroy the video footage that has captured them and captured their image. Well, Brandon Beavers talks about this a little bit because when they talk about why would you break into a church, maybe for the collection money, uh, most churches will not just have, you know, loose money on them. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people will pay through like debit cards now, or they'll pay with checks. Yeah. Um, so he was thinking that maybe one of the main reasons somebody would want to break into a church is to steal their audio and visual equipment because they have a lot of projectors and, mm -hmm. uh, recording equipment. Mm -hmm. And so maybe that would be their motive. Let's get back to this right after this quick beer break. I want to start off captain by talking about this outfit and I'm going to call it an outfit for now because or costume. Yeah. Costume, because it could be just that, um, we, what, what it appears to be obviously is SWAT uniform or riot gear, mm -hmm. tactical police, tactical gear. Um, but let's start and go kind of head to toe here because you hit on something that, that is an interesting observation regarding the helmet. Now, mm -hmm. is this helmet a real helmet? And you, you touched on the fact that it's a very, in the video, it's a very shiny helmet. Mm -hmm. It's not that matte finish. And I would think that if this is a real police SWAT helmet, that this would not be very, it wouldn't be something you would want to be shiny, right? Isn't part of that thing. It's part for protection, but also partly to conceal you. You know, mm -hmm. they make these things black for a reason. And it's possible that it'd be like a training helmet. Yeah. If there is such a thing. So a lot of people have said this could possibly be a costume. Um, mm -hmm. that this, this would be like a Halloween costume and you wonder, well, who just has Halloween costumes laying around at the ready? Uh, I think that that's actually kind of a common thing. Um, I know that, uh, <laughs> okay. Explain yourself. Well, let me explain this to you. Okay. Yeah, okay. Please so, do. So, in my home right now, I have a costume. <laughs> okay. And the reason being is every year I get invited to a Halloween party. Mm -hmm. um, and I I have gone back in, in the past, I've gone to Halloween parties in no costume at all. Because I'm not a real festive person. Mm -hmm. uh, so if somebody invites me to a Halloween party, I just didn't, I didn't take the time to go purchase a costume. So what I did was one year I purchased a costume and... After the Halloween party, it goes into a box, mm -hmm. and then every Halloween, if I'm invited to another party, I pull it out, and I'm the same thing every year. And this is what? Uh, I'm a knight. Uh, a knight? A knight. Yeah, like you carry a sword. and You have like the armor and everything? I have a little bit of armor and, <laughs> and, a, and a small cape. Um, oh. So I, I do think that it's possible that maybe somebody had a Halloween-type costume at the ready, I don't see a Halloween costume. This to me looks a little too heavy duty, mm -hmm. uh, to especially the vest. 
the the vest appears to me to be real. Um, I do think this is something that you don't have to be law enforcement or previous law enforcement to own one of these vests. I I would imagine you could get them online or at some type of army surplus store or yeah, something like that. I was doing a little digging into the army surplus store stuff. A lot of the stuff that is like uh, official police mm-hmm. or official army that you have to have identification in order to be able to purchase that. Okay. And not just like a driver's license. Like you can't purchase some like, um, and I, and I could be wrong, but this is the, the information that I was digging into mm-hmm. that if it was like a, a official police issued or a military issued that you'd have to have that um, identification. So, yeah. and, but, and so to me, this costume, it kind of seems like it's a kind of in between, okay. you know, something being official or authentic and a kind of a makeshift costume. I mean, it's pretty easy to go out. It looks like this individual is wearing, you know, probably black pants that you probably would get like cargo pants, mm-hmm. something that you would get at an army surplus store. Um, you know, it's really hard to tell what kind of jacket they're wearing underneath this vest. Right. Um, but it seems like it's kind of lo- maybe looser at the bottom. Again, this is all stuff that you could get at an army surplus store. The vest is the thing that becomes in question. Like you were saying before, the, I, I have a hard time explaining this vest because like the police and on the back, it looks very official, mm-hmm. but the helmet again, that, that, that just looks like, but I don't think the helmet is a costume helmet. Like one of those plastic fake helmets. I, it no, looks to me a, like a motorcycle helmet. Yeah, or, it's a, or, or a dirt bike helmet. Yeah, it's a legitimate helmet. Mm-hmm. But is it a legitimate uh, SWAT team helmet? I would say no. I, I I'm going to go with no. I think it's a motorcycle helmet or a dirt bike helmet. Mm-hmm. I now other people have argued about the shoes or boots. Are these black shoes or are they boots? To me, they look like boots. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know the person's wearing gloves as well. But I I'm with you, Captain. I think this outfit was pieced together. I don't think somebody went to somewhere and purchased a head to toe riot gear outfit. I think this thing was kind of pieced together. Well, let's talk about one of the things that they can kind of figure out by this, um, by this video, what they can do is they can measure certain, you know, door lengths, Mm -hmm. uh, tile lengths, and they can start figuring out the dimensions of the suspect. And one of the things that they came up with, which I still think is a little too vague. And I think, it would be nice if they could come up with a little bit more concrete evidence here, but they are saying that the suspects in between five, two and five, seven. Okay. So this would be a shorter man, uh, if it were a man, um, and yeah, but it's the average height for a woman. Correct. And the thing is, I think the reason why we have about a five inch difference here is one, one, they're, they're judging this. These cameras appear to be elevated, uh, above the suspect. Right. And so there's, you have to give a little wiggle room for that. And the other thing is the helmet and the boots, you know, what kind of, what kind of soles or heels are on these boots? Uh, how much height is the helmet itself adding to this individual? Yeah. But in Photoshop, you can do so, like the first scene, right? Mm-hmm. We're seeing this little tiny figure in the background and we see their feet. Well, we see this tile and Photoshop, you can go in and draw a line, you know, from, you know, A to B. Mm -hmm. If I draw that line in Photoshop, it's going to tell me the length of that line. And then if I take the length of the foot. Those look like uh, 24 inch by 24 inch tiles to me. That would be my guess. Yeah, they're bigger. Yeah, definitely bigger tiles. So, but, but then once you measured it in Photoshop, then you measure it in real life and then you start creating the ratios Mm -hmm. and then you could, could figure out how big these, these boots are. And that would be, I think one of the reasons why it's five, two to five, seven is also because this individual is wearing a helmet. Mm -hmm. So anybody that has a motorcycle, uh, or has rode a motorcycle and has a helmet, you'd notice that, you know, you're probably looking at maybe an inch to two inches Mm -hmm. kind of sitting above your head. So this, so again, if they think that the top spectrum of it is five, seven, I'd guess with that extra inch, especially with a boot with some height Mm -hmm. that this individual is anywhere from. Five one to five five, right? Again, putting it in the in the range more of a female than a male. Uh, regarding, let's talk about the tools. We see several tools used here. One thing that we don't see that you might expect to see with police tactical gear, 
I see no evidence of a gun on, on this person or in the person's hand at any time. Um, I also don't see a baton. Um, yeah, but we also do see evidence that this individual was putting away a hammer or they're put, putting away some kind of crowbar. Mm-hmm. And so, like you said before, maybe some kind of Batman utility belt. Yeah, and one thing that I heard reported was that the 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 tools may have come from inside the building. I do, I can't believe that. I think this mm-hmm. person showed up with these tools, and I mean the ha- the hammer, and I mean the the pry bar as well. well I think you, that's how they gained access to the building itself. Well, and if you look at the evidence of the break in, uh, first of all, there was a main window where the screen was broken out. Mm-hmm. And then they, they kind of stopped trying to break into that window and then they went through the door and they just busted through the glass window. These You'll see it in the video footage too. Uh, the, the front doors are the same where there's kind of a small glass window. They hit the glass, put their hand in, open up the door. Um, now, law enforcement are kind of confused by the whole possibly trying to break through the window because they don't think this individual would have fit through the window. Or do does the person look... The person with that walk, the other suspicion is that they might not be in any shape to pull themselves up in and through a window. Yeah, and the big conversation here is this individual's gait. And, you know, one, is it is it the way they walk for real or is it a fictitious walk? Mm-hmm. Does this person have a prosthetic leg? Do they have something wrong with their leg? You know, I have a buddy of mine that had a bad car wreck. And he kind of walks with a certain gait, right? And you would kind of you wouldn't notice it unless you were friends with him for so long. So, but the other thing too is, uh, I wonder about the boots. Do these boots fit this right. individual? Because also, I mean, have you ever seen somebody walk in flippers? Yeah, uh, in flippers. Oh, like if they're, they're yeah, scuba diving. Scuba diving. Yes. You know, you put the flippers on and you kind of walk like a penguin or something, and that's similar to the, how this person's walking. And then so is the way that they're walking. Um, is it being modified because they have larger boots on that don't fit their feet? Well, that's that's a good question because it would not be the first time. I can't reference by name uh, off the top of my head. But I know that there's been several cases over the years where somebody intentionally wore shoes or boots that were too big for them, Mm -hmm. uh, left footprints at the scene of a crime, and they were almost eliminated, eventually caught once they figured out that the person wore a pair of boots that were a size or two, two and a half sizes too big. Yeah, which is super fascinating as far as, you know, everybody always says like, well, look, uh, people watch CSI and that's not how the real world works. But the fact that they can take a shoe print and determine that the person's foot didn't fit in that shoe is pretty CSI to me. Mm-hmm. Um, let's talk about the, uh, let's back, back to the tools real quick. Mm-hmm. Um, because, and I want to stay on this just for a second because we see this person putting that pry bar away at some point. We see three different objects in the person's hand, a hammer, a pry bar, and then something that we can't, we can't decide what it is. It looks like a white box to me. Yeah. It's one of the last scenes that you'll find in this video footage. It starts about a minute 46 mm-hmm. and it's, it's, a, it's in the left hand. Cause this is when you clearly see that this suspect is hitting everything with the hammer using their right hand. So again, we could kind of assume that this individual is right handed. And again, though, we don't know if this box is something that the person picked up inside the building itself, or if it was something that they brought with them, but they at least in my opinion, brought the pry bar and the hammer with them. We see, what, what you thought might have been a flashlight, I thought could be possibly keys or something near mm-hmm. like the pants pocket. Um, possibly could just be a loose piece of clothing I underneath f- the vest. I feel like this person brought like a Batman utility belt with them and with, with several tools on it that they could adjust uh, depending on the situation, what the situation called for. Mm-hmm. Um, regarding the murder weapon... Um, it very likely could have been that hammer that we saw the person carrying it early in the get go. They were not releasing the cause of death. However, it was quickly figured out because they were issuing some, uh, search warrants 
And in one of the warrants, it stated that she had, that Missy had died from puncture wounds to the head and chest area. Um, those could have been caused by that claw hammer. Yeah. And this is another reason why people believe that this, you know, that this person was breaking into this building, into this church for the sole purpose of not burglary, mm -hmm. but to attack this fitness uh, trainer. Mm -hmm. And one of the evidence of that, or one, one speculation one can make is that this person is wearing protective gear. Mm -hmm. They have a hammer, but they got a helmet. They got this, you know, their arms are protected. Their legs are protected again, po possibly, if my if my arms are protected, that this person can't claw at me, can't get any of my DNA evidence, you know, wear gloves. Uh, so that's kind of the speculation there. Well, and I don't believe that the you know obviously this person wore it for a disguise first of all, but it probably serves multiple purposes, like you said, for some type of protection. But I also don't believe that this person wearing this outfit, that that necessarily means that this person knew that they would be on camera. Okay. Some people say that, oh, they, they went to great lengths to disguise themselves. So they must have known, they must have been in that building before, knew that they were going to be on camera at some point. I don't think so. I think that we might be dealing with a sophisticated killer, um, somebody that's fairly organized and, and planned this thing out a little bit. And, uh, I think that what we're seeing here is somebody that, that thought, you know, that is aware of the possibility of being on camera. And second of all, wanted to be protected. Whoever attacked Missy, if she was in fact targeted, um, probably expected some kind of fight, mm -hmm. um, and would want to have some form of protection one to, uh, maybe so they don't leave any evidence on her, you know, maybe that, so they don't, uh, suffer from a cut or she gets DNA underneath her fingernails when she's fighting off her attacker. The other thing, uh, and somebody brought this up. I can't remember who it was, but I found this very interesting. They said, you know, wearing, choosing a police outfit might also allow the killer to get close to Missy mm -hmm. where if she came into the building and this person's already in there and the, the, the person in the outfit could go, Look, there was a break in. Uh, we're we're just checking things out. Uh, who are you? And approach her, and then once they got close to her, they could attack her then and take her by surprise. Well, and again, the helmet. You know, again, you could speculate that this individual knew her. So if the individual knew her, they'd say, "Well, this this helmet is also going to cover up my identity." Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I can sit there and be like, "Oh, hey, it's the police." But, you know, if you saw me in a police outfit and my helmet was off, you go, that's not the police. That's the captain. If this person is wearing a motorcycle helmet, I believe that they had some kind of mask on underneath, um, maybe like a ski mask or something that you might see. You know, we've seen burglars wear these uh, types of outfits before where they'll put where you can only see their eyes. Right. Um, and in one of the, there's a short clip. It's right where the person turns and appears to be adjusting their, their gloves after they, after their failed attempt to breaking into that door. Um, I, I believe I see a white person, um, that that's, that's what I see through the helmet, through the, through the glass of the helmet, mm -hmm. uh, and into this tiny mask. It's only, it's so small though, that I can't say for 100% certainty that it is a white person, but I see a white person in that clip. Well, right. And I, I think police have, you know, basically said that that's what they believe as well. Also, Captain, uh, a burglary or was she targeted? What, what do you think here? Um, well, I think the whole thing about this, you know, sophisticated killer. I mean, again, I think this individual, look, you, if you're a sophisticated killer and you're going to break into a building that you've not aware if it has a alarm system or not. Mm -hmm. You're just going to roam around for over 30 minutes in a building thinking that the cops aren't going to show up if there's alarm system. Well, let me, let me throw this at you. Cause this is my belief of what happened. You talked about the window that somebody attempted to break into the window or may may have successfully broken into the window. We mm -hmm. don't know for certain, but we do know that they got access to the building through a door that they broke into. Right. I think this person had little to no knowledge of the building itself. And I don't think you needed to have any of that information to target Missy Beavers at that location. 
I think that the person may have arrived quite a bit earlier before they gained access to the building, broke into that window and left, left the area to see if it triggered an alarm, to see if any police showed up, to see if, you know, some places have silent alarms and others have, if you break into my home, you'll know right away that there's an alarm system because it will make this loud, annoying noise. Um, I think that once the person broke into that window, didn't hear an alarm go off. Mm -hmm. I think they could have left the area, went to a nearby location where they could watch the building itself and see if any police show up. Mm -hmm. If police show up, guess what? You go home and you're going to have to plan the murder for another day. Um, But I think when nobody showed up that this person came back and busted down that door and decided to go into the building. The strange thing here for me is the busting into doors would seem like a typical burg- burglary type activity, right? Right. Uh, but then the person never goes into these rooms. Again, I think the person's looking for the surveillance footage. I think that the cameras were probably very obvious. They're in obvious locations. And this person thought, you know what? She might not get here for another half hour or so. I'm going to look for this footage. I'm going to look for where they're storing this. I'm going to destroy that equipment or take some of it with me so they can't view it. Um, and the, the, but the strange thing is if you are lying there waiting for somebody, you would think you would want to be quiet, right? Mm -hmm. That you wouldn't want to be causing a loud disturbance. But then again, maybe that's the help that the police outfit offers you that if she does show up and you happen to be busting into a door, creating a bunch of noise, you're, you're a police officer. You're there for a good reason. Not, not for, you know, not to kill Missy. Well, one of the things that I have a hard time to get over is that, you know, you'd make all this mess. You're busting into these doors. You're leaving glass everywhere. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're the sophisticated killer, you, you are assuming that you're creating all this mess. You're opening up all this, these doors, you're creating this havoc that this individual, that Missy is going to walk in to this scenario. Mm Mm-hmm. Has to probably see a car at the church that, in the parking lot. That is why I kind of stayed on that surveillance footage of the outside of the building because we don't know if this killer would have parked at the at the church itself. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't know that. I my guess would be that maybe not. I I think that maybe a civilian vehicle outside would cause some alarm to her at that very early hour. Yeah. Uh, that you know. But as would the broken glass, as would a bunch of doors being open. Mm-hmm. She, so again, I think you know that evidence to me uh, shows more of a sign of somebody breaking into a place. Why are they there? I'm not really for sure. I don't think it's for murder though, right? Mm-hmm. I, because you, you're going to leave this trail that this individual, this you know small uh, female, uh, is going to walk past in dark. It's going to be dark because it's it's so early morning that she's going to walk through this area with all this broken glass and just go, well, there's something going on and I'm going to figure it out. Mm-hmm. I just don't think that's something that this individual would have done. I don't think Missy would have done that. I think she would have been the type of person that if she saw broken glass and all this stuff that she might not walk in mm-hmm. and, and, and just maybe call the cops. Well, but here's the thing. If, if this is not a stranger on stranger murder, uh, if it's not random and she was targeted, then there's some connection between the suspect and her. And maybe this sophisticated killer that I'm calling this person, maybe they were trying to stage some type of burglary, um, maybe trying to make it look that way, especially if they would have gotten away with the surveillance footage. If we wouldn't have had that where we see the person casually, walking around the building. Um, I think a lot of people would have thought this was a potential robbery or burglary and that she surprised this person. They reacted and then fled the scene. Now she was killed very near the entrance, if not right at the entrance of this church. So she was, I don't believe her to be in the building for very long at all. Uh, when she was attacked to me, that makes more sense of, this individual goes around, they bust up all these doors, they bust up all these windows. You know, did she enter the 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 door that was broken into? No. So we we had, do we do know that that she she came in a different uh entrance. So she's killed 
at the, the, at the entrance that she's entering. And I believe the way it's been described is that she was killed near the main entrance. So I'm guessing this would be on the front portion of the building. Uh, this individual could have accessed the building by breaking into a side door or a door that's in the back of the building. Right. But think about it this way. If you know a little bit about that, look, it, let's say you're in class with her. You're one of her students. You'd probably find out pretty quickly that there's no alarm system. Like you show up the same time as your teacher. She opens up the door. She doesn't say, you know, like when I work at the studio and somebody meets me at the same time the session is mm -hmm. and I got to go in the studio, I got to go, hey, you got to stay outside because I got to shut the door behind me, lock it, turn off the alarm system. Right. Right. But if, if they've walked in with their teacher before and she says, okay, well, open up the door. I'll come on in. Mm -hmm. Oh, don't you have to turn off the alarm system? Oh, no, there's no alarm system here. Right. That's that simple to know that information. And again, you now have somebody breaking into a different entrance and not the front entrance. Again, I think that's evidence that shows that this individual knows a little bit about this building, mm -hmm. knows a little bit about her, or it's just a coincidence. But that's a lot of coincidences. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I'm I'm with you, but I'm going to go ahead and and rule out the possibility of burglary. Um, she she had her wedding ring on her that was not taken. Nothing appears to have been taken from the building or from Missy. She had her uh, iPad and a cell phone with her. Um, I, I'm I'm still I'm still on the thought that this person broke in and was waiting for her to arrive and attacked her upon arrival. Yeah, unless it's just some weird, sick individual that just wanted to roam around a church for no reason and then gets startled by somebody and then decides to, you know, attack them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's that doesn't add up to me, though. The thing here, too, Captain, remember we said that Missy had posted on her Facebook page the day before she was murdered mm -hmm. uh, that she was going to be hosting the class the next morning at 5 a.m., rain or shine, and it was raining that day, so the class was going to be uh, hosted inside, indoors. Uh, a lot of people have pointed out that that makes some kind of connection to people that knew about this gladiator training class, this gladiator fitness class. Uh, maybe somebody in the group that had received that message because she was attacked inside. The person broke in and seems, like I think, waiting for her indoor. And I don't know if this was reported. I don't know if it was on on her personal page or if it was for the class specific, like a, a the right. gladiator training Facebook page. Yeah. Just because, you know, you, you can have your, you know, private, you know, your profile set to private. Mm -hmm. So this individual would have to be friends with her or was it a public page or is her page public? I assume it would be public yeah. because she has a job where she's trying to, she needs to recruit people uh, clients yeah. yeah yeah i agree with you i would guess that it would be public i don't know for certain uh but here here's my thought on this i don't know <laughs> i have to laugh as they say this i don't know anything about this gladiator training well class. you don't know anything about facebook either right so i don't know what type of workout session this would be what mm. equipment more importantly what equipment is required uh to to host this class well, and I think that's tough too, because you know all fitness classes will vary. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could have a CrossFit class where you're using barbells and pull up bars, but you could also have a CrossFit type class where you're doing nothing but body weight. Mm -hmm. So, I think it would just vary based on the instructor and what they thought they could do or what they could do with the equipment that was in the church. Right now, I've been at gyms before, and I've seen personal trainers arrive to the gym to teach their, you know, to train whoever, and they arrive with equipment they, that they bring with them. I've also been in gyms where I've seen personal trainers, uh, fitness teachers, uh, open up a closet, uh, a lot, maybe even a locked closet and pull equipment from the closet itself. Mm -hmm. I, I'm very curious to know if she would have brought all the equipment with her physically, or if it was common that she would, access the building for the equipment for some purpose of teaching the class outside, you know, bringing this equipment outside with her because, you know, it seems like this person had some knowledge that she would be in the building. And if, if this was the only time that she ever accessed the building because it was raining, um, maybe that seems like they would have to know about this Facebook 
post or the message itself. Yeah, I think that's, again, that's highly unlikely because, again, I think if that individual was there and it was such a sophisticated killer, they knew that this building didn't have alarm system. And I, well, I think that she um, had her own key to the building would be mm-hmm. my guess. I'm, I'm not, I'm, I wouldn't guess that she announces that the class is going to be indoor tomorrow and then has to go get a key sometime that day right. so she could get into the building. I'm thinking that she probably accessed the building most of the time before these classes, and that's what this killer was was betting on. If you'd like to check out the surveillance video that we're talking about, go to www truecrimegarage.com and it'll be right on the home page. All right, Captain, I'm excited to get to part two of this because there's so many more things that we, we didn't get to uh, regarding her family, um, her father-in-law, a bloody shirt. There's more surveillance footage to discuss, um, but we will get that get to that in tomorrow's episode. Again, that video will be posted at truecrimegarage.com. There's, we have our blog there. So once you, once you check out the video, Make sure you leave us your thoughts and your opinions as to what you're seeing. I'm sure there'll be a lot of good discussion there. All right. Till tomorrow, be good, be kind, and don't let it.